Hi everybody, this is Steve Ludwig, host of Steve Ludwig's Classic Pop Culture at PlanetLudwig.com. Here's an interview we did with Tommy James, original broadcast date, November 19, 2013, show number 16. To hear the entire show, check out the menu at PlanetLudwig.com and please enjoy the interview. Our next guest, everyone, absolutely needs no introduction, but... He certainly deserves an introduction. He has sold over 100 million records. He's been awarded 23 gold singles and nine gold and platinum albums. He's had over 300 covers of his songs. And I want to know what's taking so long to induct Mr. Tommy James into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Tommy, thank you for joining us. Ah, great talking with you. Uh, I'll tell you, Tommy, I just touched upon it. Um, the Hall of Fame bases many of their selections on people that have inspired other people. And if anyone in rock music has inspired, it's, it's Tommy James and the Shondells. I mean, it's only a matter of time before the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame calls, don't you feel? <laughs> well, listen, thank you. It's good of you to say that. I, I basically feel like, uh, you know, my position is that when it's our turn, it'll happen and, uh, you know, it'll, it'll work. It'll happen, Tommy. It, it, I mean, you are uh, a treasure, a musical treasure to all of us who grew up with you. And even my engineer, Rick, he's 30 years old, and he was listening to the <laughs> Medley, and he said, I know all these songs. And I said, of course, it's Tommy James. <laughs> well, it's nice of you to say. Thank you very much. Um, Tommy, I want to talk to you about your book, your Christmas album, but let's start with something that's going to happen this Thursday uh-huh. uh, on, on Sirius XM Radio. Could you give us a little uh, little sure. background of what's going to happen? Well, I, I, what I did was an, was an hour special uh, for Sirius XM in front of a live audience with just my acoustic guitar and a couple of friends who also had acoustic guitars who, who were with me, including Mike Vale from the original Shondells mm. and uh, Jonathan Ash, who is a terrific uh, jazz player who is playing with me. And uh, we're all friends and writing partners. And so we just did it unplugged. And uh, uh, the audience was great, and it was with uh, Bruce Morrow, cousin Brucey, Good old and cousin Bruce. uh, he really is a, a, an amazing character. You know, he's been in, <laughs> in radio for you know since the '50s, and the guy is really, really incredible. He's been a friend of mine for oh, almost 50 years, mm-hmm. and uh, so um, uh, we did this uh, just this live uh, uh, special, live show. Uh, we taped it or put it in Pro Tools, <laughs> and we uh, uh, are going to air it on uh, Sirius XM 60s on 6 at um, 6 p.m. on Thursday, and again at noon on Monday. So it's going to be it's going to be a fun show. Um, it's it, just to know that you're with Mike Vale. I mean, I know there's been a couple of times that you've played with him since the. Uh, Shondell sure. split, but uh, that's going to be a treat for all of us original Shondells. Well, listen, I can't I, you know, it's, it's gonna, it was fun for me because it was, uh, first of all, I've never done a show like that, on, you know, with, with just acoustic guitars. And play, we played uh, Crystal Blue Persuasion, which Mike and I wrote, and uh, Crimson and Clover, and I Think We're Alone Now, and oh uh, Sweet Cherry Wine, and Dragon the Line. We did them all acoustically. And I had never wow. done that before, so it was really a first for me, too. Uh, you mentioned four or five titles just there. I mean, everyone knows those songs, Tommy. How does it make you feel to know that you have made such an impact on so many people's lives and continue to? Well, thank you. I, honestly, uh, I just thank the, the good Lord and the fans for the kind of longevity we've had. I um, never figured, you know, this is a business that maybe gives you two years, three if you're lucky, and we've been doing it since 1966, and I am, and nobody's more amazed than I am that we're able to do it that way. I look out at our concert crowd now, and I literally see three generations of people. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yep. I, I, I've seen you on numerous occasions, and you're right. There's such a cross generation of fans you have, and you tell your story, Tommy, in this book of yours, a new book, "Me, the Mob, and the Music." Right. One hell of a ride with Tommy James and the Shondells. And Rolling Stone magazine says 
Tommy James's rock and roll education cost him millions, but at least we got this entertaining memoir. <laughs> T- Tommy, I read the book when it first came out. This is such an incredible story. Can well, you tell us a bit you. about a bit how it came about? And then I have some specific questions to ask you about the sure. book. Sure. Um, well, the reason for the provocative title, Me, the Mob, and the Music, is because Roulette Records, the uh, uh, record company that, that we had uh, most of our hits with, um, uh, ended up being a very notorious kind of a place. Uh, uh, first of all, um, unbeknownst to us, when we signed with Roulette in the very beginning, um, Roulette was not only a functioning record company, but it was also a front for the Genovese crime family in New York. And of course, <laughs> that made life real interesting. And we didn't know anything about it, and we and we couldn't talk about it. So, um, you know, the bottom line was that, uh, uh, of course, the story that is about two thirds of the book, even though it's an autobiography, about two thirds of the book um, is about that very tumultuous and, and and oftentimes scary and crazy relationship we had with roulette records all those years and couldn't say a word about it and uh, actually when we started uh, writing the book uh, martin fitzpatrick and i uh who who uh, co-authored it with me uh, uh we were going to write a nice music but we were going to write about only the music we were going to call it crimson and clover and we were going to write about the hits and it would have been a fun book, and we'd you know talked about the studio and stuff, mm-hmm. uh, but we got about a third of the way into it and realized that if we if we don't tell the whole story, the meaning the roulette story, that we really were cheating everybody, including ourselves. Mm-hmm. And I was a little nervous, to be honest, uh, uh, finishing the book at that point. It was about that was about eight years ago, and. Uh, uh, you know, some of these guys were still walking around. <laughs> so, Tommy, so, I, I, I'd be scared out of my wits. It was, so I, I basically, uh, uh, we kind of put it on a shelf for a couple of years. And then in uh, uh, at Christmas time, actually, late December of uh, 05, the last of the um, roulette regulars, as we called them, uh, passed on. Mm-hmm. And I felt that we could we could really write the book and, and, and do it justice because we didn't have to look over our shoulder, don't it? So, um, uh, it took us another, uh, several years to get, to get everything perfect and to, uh, spell every name, by name, right. <laughs> and to, uh, you know, recheck all of our facts because, you know, I, and so finally, um, uh, when we finished uh, the book, um, we immediately was a, were approached uh, by Simon and Schuster, and which was kind of surprising to us because usually they do, you know, presidential memoirs and stuff like that. <laughs> and so uh, uh, we were really happy to have it out through Simon and Schuster. And then immediately when the book was released, um, we started getting calls for the movie rights and for the Broadway rights. And so it's going to be a film. It's going to be a movie produced by Barbara Defina, who produced uh, Goodfellas oh and uh, 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 Casino and, um, oh, um, Cape Fear. She did Hugo two years ago with Martin Scorsese. Oh, wow. uh, and it's, so she's had a really a great string of, of hits. And she's this petite little cute little woman who's about five feet tall. You would never in a million years figure her for doing those kind of movies. Mob movies. Right? Yeah, and uh, so uh, we're just really uh, very flattered that she's doing it. So the next two years are going to be real interesting. We're, we're at the screenplay stage right now, and uh, it looks like Universal is going to distribute the movie. And uh, so we're... Uh, that's as far as we've gotten uh, 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 so far, and, and uh, so we, we have a long way to go. But congratulations, uh, it's going to happen. That, that is so wonderful. And now, I, I actually was at the same opening night you were with uh, the Rascals play on Broadway. Yeah. The only reason I know that is because you were mobbed in the lobby, and Tommy, <laughs> you were the nicest guy because you just was patient. You were patient with everyone, took pictures, and reading this book, this would translate so well to the stage, even. Well, you know, you know, it's funny. I um, 
we were we talked about that and uh Barbara is going to be involved also with the stage production with it but but you know it's so weird because the movie is going to be a very uh factual very you know dark in many cases uh story whereas the 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 Broadway show is going to be a musical which is going to be more lighthearted and you know mm-hmm. it's telling the story in two totally different ways and uh so it's a, I'm really it's, <laughs> kind of schizophrenic, but um, uh, it's going to be the next couple of years are going to be real interesting. Uh, this is a silly question, but with the movie, will your music actually be kind of incidental to it? It's more of a drama than a music. Yeah, you, well, you know, you, you're quite right on that. The um, uh, rather than being a musical, this is going to be a, a dramatic story with uh, with music rather than trying to wrap the story around the music. And mm-hmm. I. I I really, because because there is a story there. It's my, you know, there, oh, you know, really. Is there uh, ever? Uh, and and it, it, it's true. <laughs> and so uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, the music, the the broad, the stage show, and the movie are going to be two really different animals. Mm-hmm. I want to let our listeners know that go to tommyjames dot com and they can get an autographed copy of Meet the Mob and the Music. That that That's is true. Awesome. It's also, of course, anywhere. Books are sold um, at bookstores, but also at Amazon and Barnes and, and uh, Noble and all. Yeah, yeah, it's in its its eighth printing now, and we're just amazed oh. at the reaction from the public and from the media, wow. uh, because it's uh, uh, you know it's it, it's really kept on selling, and I'm I'm really, I've never been an author before, so I'm I'm very flattered by it. Well, Tommy, with your concerts and just the the uh, feedback you get from the audience. You can't be too surprised that this book is such a hit. Your story and your music, and now your story, but I didn't know the 90% of the story, but you are so beloved by the music community, and it's got to do your heart good. Well, it sure does, and I thank you for that. I, uh, I must say that um, uh, they've really uh, uh, taken to the, the story. and I, You know, the funny part is you, know, you mentioned the Rascals before. Mm-hmm. And uh, who are great friends of mine, and um, uh, Stevie Van Zandt uh, put them back together with us. Right. You know, his, and his, he and his wife Maureen wrote the Rascals' um, stage show, uh, "Once Upon a Dream," right. and they're going to be on Broadway again. By the way, um, I think this, it's a marquee, but I'm not sure. Yeah, but yes. in the middle, middle of December they start. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, they've just done great, and I. I but. The, the amazing thing is what they did was they created a, the, their show is the history of the group, mm-hmm. which uh, had never really quite been done like that before. And uh, it's inspired us. We are, we are actually putting a new show together called uh, One Hell of a Ride. And um, we're going to premiere Perfect. the show. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to premiere a new, new show uh, it's, which is also going to be the history of the group. We're doing it a little differently than the Rascals are doing mm-hmm. it, but we're going to premiere the show uh, May 17th at the um, uh, Bergen Pack in uh, Performing Anglewood. Arts Center. In, in, in Englewood, uh, New Jersey. Englewood, yes. Oh, excellent. Oh, boy, I can't wait for that. Yeah, We had uh, Eddie Brigatti on a couple of months Good ago. Good friend of mine. He, he, I love great Eddie. Great guy. You know, you, you mentioned that this this uh, one hell of a ride show. It reminded me a little bit when you said that. I know when your traveling album came out in 1970, and the tour you guys did supporting that album. I mean, you did the hits, but that was kind of like a concept tour with the traveling album. The traveling album, yeah. What well, album? Was the wrong time I, I, I love to have over uh, one million small uh, businesses like New York. Uh, I've, I've loved the idea of doing uh, thematic tours um, if you're going to do it. Now, we do a lot of one-nighters, but the idea, if you're going to go on tour, it should be a thematic tour and, and generally around your your project. Um, you know, either your uh, album or your movie, or in this case, it's going to be our book because One Hell of a Ride is the subtitle to Meet a Mob and the Music. And uh, so, um, you know, I'm really, I'm really happy to be doing it that way. Um. Everyone, we're talking with Tommy James, of course, the legendary Tommy James. Right now, we're talking about Me, the Mob, and the Music. One Hell of a Ride with Tommy James and the Shondells, written by Tommy James with Martin Fitzpatrick. Available 
at all the usual book outlets online and especially at TommyJames.com. You can get an autographed copy. Tommy, I love your website, by the way. It is Thank very you very website. much. Thank There's you. so much. Uh, you can spend literally at least an hour on the website with all the things you have to offer. So, guys, go to TommyJames.com, too, and there's so much great merch there. Oh, thanks for the plug. Oh, are you kidding? Uh, <laughs> it's my pleasure. Thanks for the website. Um, I want to mention the name Morris Levy. Uh, for, yeah. those, for those who don't know, he was the head of Roulette Records. Right. Um, Very notorious character. Yeah. I, I, from what I got from this story, it, it certainly was a love-hate relationship. Yes. Uh, well, you know, Morris was one of the most fascinating, maybe the most fascinating person I've ever met. Um, he was a mob associate, uh, no doubt about it. They used roulette as a social club. I mean, you know, everything from a social club to uh, illegal bank accounts and God knows what else was going on out there. But uh, the point was that every time I go to say something, nasty about Morris or Roulette, I got to stop myself because the truth is, if it wasn't for Morris Levy, there wouldn't have been a Tommy James. And that's the truth. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the basic story of Me, the Mob, and the Music is this sort of uh, crazy relationship between me and Morris. It's and, such a complex and, relationship. It is, and... and, and uh, 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 you know, it was sort of like a, a, a father-son relationship, an abusive father-son relationship. No. But, uh, um, you know, Morris was was absolutely essential to my career. And, uh, and uh, you know, you know this crazy odd couple story of this sort of hick kid growing up in the Midwest and Morris, who... Uh, was 20 years older than I was, who who grew up in the Bronx and uh, really came off the street in ev in every way. He was uh, uh, about six foot four, uh, weighed about 270, uh, was you know talk like this. Right. <laughs> uh, he was a character right out of the movies and uh, a very scary individual. And but the strange thing was he heard hits. He yeah. could hear hits, and he really, I got an education up at Roulette like I could have never had anywhere else, a complete education in the record business, and then just all the nuts and bolts, all the way from writing songs and studio production to the, the marketing of, of the uh, to album covers and the retail end of it, and uh, just every every inch of the, of the record business I learned at Roulette and yeah. uh, watching after, Morris. After reading the book, the, the cover of the Traveling album is hilarious now, knowing that yeah. it's Morris. <laughs> Morris That's is following right. you guys on the stage coach. <laughs> yes, Morris chasing us is one of the robbers. Um, yeah. you know, a great point I thought you made in the book, too. Roulette was a relatively small record label, but yeah. you felt that that gave you more freedom. Uh, absolutely, and the, the reason was, uh, you know, I, I'll quickly, uh, I'll try not to be too long-winded on this. No, not at all. When Hanky Panky uh, exploded out of Pittsburgh very unexpectedly in 1966, in the spring of 1966, I had recorded it in uh, my hometown of Niles, Michigan, two years earlier, but while I was still in high school. And... Um, uh, you know, we it was really a miracle. I mean, it was a fluky record. Uh, you know, one copy ended up in Pittsburgh, and <laughs> it was bootlegged. And uh, right off the record, they they literally went made a tape of the record, and then bootlegged eighty thousand of them and sold them in ten days. And we were number one in Pittsburgh. I mean, it was just one of those freaky only in America stories. Uh, yeah, surreal almost. I'll bet. Yeah, and so. Um, I I and I just happened to be home at the right moment um, uh, to get the call that that changed my life, and so I went to Pittsburgh and sort of grabbed the first bar band I could find to be the Shondells because I couldn't put the the original group back together. Mm -hmm. So a week later, we're in New York uh, selling the master, and we get a yes from Columbia, RCA, Atlantic. Uh, Kamasutra, remember Kamasutra records? Sure, uh, Love and yeah. Spoonful, right? Right, right. And um, 
the last place we took the record to was roulette. And, um, you know, it was sort of an afterthought. Mm -hmm. And uh, Morris wasn't there, and we just kind of dumped off the record. Because <laughs> I went to sleep that night feeling like we were going to sign with either CVS or RCA, one of the corporate labels. Mm -hmm. And so I'm feeling real good. And the next morning, I wake up and the phone starts ringing. Um, and I, it's it's all these record companies that had said yes the day before. And uh, saying, listen, Tom, uh, we got to pass. And I said, what do you mean you got to pass? I thought we had a deal. And finally, Jerry Wexler at Atlantic uh, told me the truth that uh, Morris Levy, the head of Roulette Records, had called all the other record companies and said, this is my record. Back off. Oh, my. What With a few that? cuss words in there. And, oh, and they did. And it scared everybody. And I... I you know, red flags should have gone off right at that moment. You know, that there's something that was very wrong here. Uh, but that's the kind of reach Morris had. And you were so much younger, though, too. I was right? 19, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, you didn't... So I, anyway, we, that was the first offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> right. so, so we ended up being on roulette records. But I've often thought, if we had been with one of those corporate labels that we could have gone with... I can tell you right now that with with a fluky record like Hanky Panky, we would have been maybe a one hit wonder. We would have been lost in the numbers. We were in the numbers of artists. We would have been handed over to an in house A and R guy, and that would have probably been the last time anybody had ever heard from us. At Roulette, they actually needed us. They hadn't had a hit in three years, and so. Um, you know, I yeah. they they gave us the, the, the endless budgets to make mm -hmm. records with. They basically left us alone and allowed us to make all the decisions about our career. And that was amazing. That would have never happened at any other right. label. Yeah, is it, it? It is funny sometimes how things just fall into place. Yeah, I, I, and, it's, I guess with life, you, you really do never know. <laughs> and we were allowed to sort of morph into whatever we could become. We were allowed to evolve at our own pace. That would have never happened at any of the other labels. Yeah. Tommy, I think a perfect example of that is Cellophane Symphony. I mean, one of the most experimental, but <laughs> wow. I mean, yeah. you see, I, I love traveling. I love Cellophane Symphony, which had the hits on it too. But you guys really... I give you so much credit because you could have just gone for let's do the hit, the hit, the hit. But you guys did what you wanted to do. And well, you we were, to we were yeah, we were very lucky. I mean, of course, uh, you know, the, having the hits that we did allowed us to allowed us to be, experiment mm. because we could we had plenty of budgets to experiment with. And um, Self and Symphony, for example, was the first Moog synthesizer in New York City. Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, it was analog. I mean, it was you know, it was it looked like an old antique switchboard, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, with the RCA plugs and everything. It looked and uh, from the twenties, but it was uh, the first synthesizer in New York City in a studio. It was owned by Whitey Ford from the New York Age. You, know, you know, I was going to say that was one of the most surreal moments in the book. I, I had to read it. I said. Whitey Ford and Tommy James were associated. Can you imagine? <laughs> uh, you should have you should have heard him talking rock and roll and me talking baseball. That was one of the most <laughs> hysterical conversations that ever existed. <laughs> what went but, on? <laughs> yeah, but but you know it was true, and um, uh, he owned one of his big investments was a little studio called Broadway Sound up on Fifty Fourth and Broadway in New York, and. Uh, uh, that's where the first synthesizer was. And we ended up doing a whole album there. And, I, mean, just the, uh, I was going to say, just the first track, the nine-minute cellophane symphony. Yeah. But I'm, Tommy, it's just a, that's another one that I think your hardcore fans must always tell you, that is one cool album. Well, Isn't thank it? you very much. It's very 60s. And, uh, yeah. uh, you know, we... Uh, we were just we were real babes with the with the uh, with the synthesizer. Of course, everybody else was too. That was nineteen sixty nine. Once again, we're talking with the one and only Tommy James about his book, "Me, the Mob, and the Music." 
written by Tommy James with Martin Fitzpatrick, available at all the usual outlets, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, and get your autographed copy at TommyJames.com. Speaking of TommyJames.com, Tommy, your Christmas album from 2007 is now available on vinyl. At your yes, home. I know. Well, you know, we've, we've had, uh, you know, people were after me to do a Christmas album for a long time. We have our own label now, Aura Records, and we're internationally distributed by Allegro. And um, uh, I just, you know, we had the uh, the CD of the Christmas album. We Jimmy Wisner, who uh, and I produced it, and we actually had the original Shondells up for two of the cuts. We were actually, I, one of the cuts I actually wrote with Mike Vale. Um, it's Christmas again, I think we're talking about, right? Yes, that's yeah. right. And uh, so uh, we, we'd had such good luck with the Christmas album. It sells every year. We just thought that it would be great to put it out on vinyl. We're actually going to, with the label, we're going to start doing limited vinyl on a bunch of our stuff. Yeah, um, I, and I, I'm a vinyl nut, you know. Oh, Tommy, tell me about it. My uh, nephews are in their 20s, and they swear by vinyl. What is it yeah. about vinyl? What, well, why does it I, have that? The vinyl, you know, is is it's such a different listening experience. First of all, um, you know, you you can actually read the album cover, <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, and all the information. Well, on the back so without glasses. Yeah. Yes, right. And, uh, and and so that's great. But it's, you know, the album covers were like a piece of art. They were a work of art. And listening is such a different experience because, you know, instead of, you know, just flipping the disc in a drawer and having it disappear, uh, when you play a vinyl record, you, you, you know, you gently take it out of the record jacket and then uh, and then the and then the sleeve comes off the disc and then you carefully put it on your turntable and gently put the needle down on the on the record and it, when baby. you listen and then you only hear half the album <laughs> right yeah <laughs> so so you got to turn it over so you you know you're much more hands on but then you listen to the to the the sound coming off the disc and the thing is alive you know, you hear the, the S's and the T's and, oh, the, yes. and all the, the high end uh, coming off the needle. And, and I, for me, I just love that. I love watching the record go around. I love uh, just the whole feel of, of vinyl. And, of course, that's, I'm showing how old I am. But I'm right uh, with you, Tommy. <laughs> you know, but you know who's buying the vinyl now? College kids. Yes. I, my nephews are in their 20s. And Isn't that amazing? They really like they get the vinyl. They have to have the vinyl. Yeah. So I'm, we're so glad. So we, the, our Christmas album is the first album we've released um, on our label uh, with vinyl. And I can't believe how it's selling. I mean, it's really quite amazing. And we're going to release other uh, of, our, of our albums, uh, maybe even our live album that we did at the bitter end a few years ago. We're going to release oh, that. What uh, a fantastic live album. And, and what a great double fold out. But you know what's so amazing about the vinyl is that just from a production standpoint is, you know, you never have to concern yourself with mastering uh, a CD, you know, you know, they, mm -hmm. they, they get the levels right. And it's pretty much digital. So it's good. But with vinyl, you have to actually, there's a science to cutting the groove grooves and and um, and uh, you you have to be very careful plus the fact that uh, you have to you can only get 22 minutes aside so you got to actually cut the album in half at some midway point and there's all kinds of problems doing that but it was so much fun to actually master a final album um, after all these years I haven't been on my voice hasn't been on a vinyl record in 30 years well <laughs> Tommy, no, speaking anyway. of speaking of your voice, Tommy, uh, on the Christmas song. I mean, your voice we know is a great voice, but you hit some high notes on Mel Torme's "The Christmas Song" on this Christmas. Oh, album. I love thank Christmas. you, Tommy. You, it was amazing. I mean, not that I, I'm surprised by it because we know you have a great voice, but boy, you hit those high notes. Well, you know, it's fun doing the album rendition. because I thank you so much. I had to, I had to stretch uh, as an artist. Uh, doing that Christmas album. It really uh, is amazing. I love, I love doing, uh, uh, I love doing the album. Um, uh, first of all, Christmas songs are really beautiful when you analyze them just as, as, as works of art. And, um, uh, also vocally, you can just really let yourself go. 
Mm-hmm. And I, I, I was really pleased with the way uh, it came out. I'm, I'm very, very proud of that album. So thank you very much. Well, you know, we love vinyl, but we also love the fact, Tommy, that you gave us uh, CDs of I Love Christmas to give out to our lucky listeners. Sure. So at the end of the show, everyone, keep listening. I'll explain just how you can get these CDs. Tommy, we love you for doing that, and I appreciate that so oh, much. My pleasure. Hope you like it. Oh, uh, well, when they hear this CD, they're going to love it because I've heard it numerous times. Mm-hmm. Um, now, Tommy, I want to also let our listeners know about this great 40 years singles collection, Tommy right. Johnson, 1966 to 2006. Right. And it's got all 47 of your singles. Right. Well, that's in the stores now, too. Yeah. And um, uh, this was uh, actually, it was a real labor of love because uh, we had uh, singles on, uh, you know, on roulette. We had them on millennium. We had them on, uh, fantasy. And, um, so we had to collect all of our, um, uh, all of our singles from the different record companies and get them all in one package, which wasn't easy. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, we have released this called Tommy James and Sean does 40 years. And it is all of the, Singles, of, uh, as you say, from 1966 to 2006, released sequentially. Mm-hmm. So they're on, it's a two-disc um, album, and uh, um, I just uh, as I said, it was really fun putting it together. But we had we had a tough time putting it together, and there's a lot of original mono on the on the album, which you know I'm yes, a mono you know, nut too. I was going to say mono versus stereo time. Yeah, mono, right? Well, you know, on AM radio, there was nothing better. I mean, there's all, you could only do mono. Um, uh, but, you know, the funny part is um, I love mixing mono singles because it's such a different... Uh, um, they're so different than stereo in so many different ways. It doesn't seem like it would be, but it really is because you're mixing really from the center of the speaker. And... I don't want to get too technical, but, you know, in stereo mixes, you can pan things out of the way. In other words, if the guitar and the piano are exactly in the same place, you can pan one uh, to the left and one more to the right, mm-hmm. and and so you can hear them both. With mono, you couldn't do that. With mono, everything's on top of everything else, so you basically had to EQ things out of the way. Right. And and do things with little effects and things to get, uh, let's say, for the acoustic guitar uh, uh, out of the way of the electric guitar, for example. Mm. And and uh, so you had to EQ them out of each other's way. It was such a different science making mm. mono records than stereo records. Tommy, can I squeeze five more minutes out of you? Sure. Oh, thanks. I have. I wanted to um, ask you. In 1971, you were given an award for Dragon the Line, mm-hmm. and you met John Lennon, who was receiving his award for Imagine. What was that? Right. Meeting that's like? right. We actually sat back to back. You know. By the way, I was with. I was just with Julian Lennon up at Sirius uh, when we did the special. Uh, have you ever great, met him before? Great. I had never met Julian, and it was so great talking to him. Uh, we had a nice talk, a really nice talk up there. Uh, but I originally met his father, uh, John Lennon, at uh, at the BMI dinner. He and Yoko sat back to we sat back to back from each other <laughs> in those big banquet tables, you know, the big round banquet tables. Right. And he was getting it for Imagine, and I got it for Dragging the Line. And uh, we had a really nice talk. And I, it was just such a, uh, I, you know. The, the year before that, George Harrison had written me a whole bunch of songs um, uh, that, you know, Moni Moni had been the number one song in England for oh, several weeks. Actually, it was a, it was as big over there, bigger than it was here. And so uh, George and a group that he was producing called Grapefruit wrote me a bunch of songs and sent them over to me and they, because when Apple was starting out, it was originally going to be a publishing company. Mm-hmm. And they were, their idea was to write songs for all their friends, uh, the Beatles songs for all, for, all, for different artists. Mm-hmm. And then it became a label after that. But uh, when they sent me these songs, we were already into 
Crimson and Clover and Crystal Blue Persuasion and so forth. So we, our style had radically changed from Moni Moni. So I ended up not being able to do these songs. I still have the tape, by the way. And wow. so uh, I had is, never... Are they ever going to see the light of day, Tommy? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I had never um, uh, had a proper chance to thank George and when... <laughs> Uh, uh, or, or, or work with the Beatles. I had never worked with them. So meeting John at the BMI dinner was really a thrill, and we got to talk. I still have never met Ringo and, and Paul. Uh, mm-hmm. I, uh, isn't that amazing? As, as many years as, as we pa- keep passing right. each other. Yeah. Well, thankfully, they're still with us. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, um, indeed. I wanted to just quickly ask you about your... Uh, you were in uh, the Cowsills family band documentary yeah, you were sure. friends with the castles yeah. um that was some dysfunctional family bob castle was on a few months ago he's one of the nicest guys around too as right. i guess all the castles on but um you were friends with the castles weren't oh, you? very definitely they lived in my building in new york and uh uh were managed by my manager and in fact uh, lenny stogel my manager and his wife um discovered the castles in connecticut mm. And uh, brought them into the city and introduced them. And uh, Jimmy Wisner, my arranger, arranged their their first album, their first record, uh, Rain in the Park and other things. Mm-hmm. And a good friend of mine, Artie Kornfeld, produced them. And um, so they moved into my building. And um, uh, Lenny Stogel was there in my building, too. So we were all just one big happy family. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, I got to know them really well mm-hmm. and, um, they were just good people, just mm-hmm. very decent people. And uh, one of the problems of course was that their father who managed them, mm-hmm. uh, could be a real tyrant. And he was a, he was, um, he would get loaded. That demon alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, mistreat him. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, got pretty serious, and you know, every now and then, a uh, uh, couple of the kids would come up to my place and just kind of hang. They ask if they could hang at my place till their dad. Mm, it's so nice that you were there for them, Tom. Yeah, and I, I was, um, I always felt terrible about that. Um, I never really confronted anybody. I didn't think it was my place, but yeah. uh, it was. Uh, uh, you know, it's just it's kind of like I'm here stuff. if you need me, right? It was that yep, kind of a thing. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Well, everyone, I have and to of course, you, Excuse me, but one of them sure. passed away, you know, in Katrina. Uh, yes. Uh huh. One and of the another, brothers, and then another, the other brother passed away when they were at the Katrina brothers' funeral. That so, I didn't know. Yeah, that uh, they. That's when they found out when they were at the funeral that their other brother had passed away. Talk about. Oh, it. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, everyone, sorry, yeah, yeah, but they, the rest of them are still on the road, and, yeah. and, and, and so are you, Tommy, and we're so happy for all your success. Everyone, I want to remind you, it's me, the mob, and the music, and there are so many great stories. We won't go into it, but you mentioned Artie Kornfeld, the great Woodstock story in the book. Sure. And the, the ending of the book, Tommy, is so tender, and you talk about your relationship with Morris Levy and his last yeah. days. It's, it's just a... a, a Super ending. I don't want to give it away because I want people to. Well, remember. let me just tell you the last yes. scene in the movie uh, and in the book uh, is where Morris passes away, mm-hmm. and uh, we, it was a, a very, you know, it was a, it was a very, in many ways, very traumatic moment because life without Morris was, you know, sort of unimaginable. But um, the, the story just goes up to 1990, uh, where he dies, mm-hmm. and um, in the movie. Uh, the very last uh, song that's going to play is this brand new version that I, I brought the original Shondells, the three surviving members, up to New York. And we went in the studio and did this beautiful version of I Think We're Alone Now, which uh, oh. is slow and acoustic and totally different from the original record. Can't wait to hear that. And uh, th- it's going to be the closing credits to the movie and uh, of course and, but what's so amazing about it is that it, it the meaning of the song completely changes because uh, uh, from you know a, a teenage love song to 
Morris is gone, and I think we're alone now. And oh, uh, what so, a, uh, it what a actually, great such, a, such a different uh, meaning, and yet using the exact same words. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, what, what a great, great idea. So anyway, that was, uh, that's going to be the closing credits. We actually did the song on the Sirius um, XM. Oh, that's, that's this Thursday. Oh, that's yes. wonderful. Oh, we'll get So I had that. never done it before live, and we did it. Yeah. Again, everyone, Tom is talking about uh, this Thursday, uh, November 21st, 5 or 6 p.m. I'm not sure. Tom. It's going to be sorry. on at 6. 6 p.m. 6, 6 Eastern 6. time. And then uh, the following Monday at noon. At noon. And uh, the name of the book is Me, the Mob, and the Music. I Love Christmas is the album. Uh, there's so much more to Tommy James. Just go on TommyJames.com. So much great merch. The bio. It's just it's, Tommy, it, you like I said earlier, you're a musical Well, thank treasure. you so much, and how great it's been to talk. You really did your homework, I can tell uh, you. That. <laughs> well, I, I told you I'm a Shondell's fan. Oh, real quick, Shondell is based on someone, a singer that you liked, correct? Or well, yeah, well, no, I actually, that you know, a lot of people thought that I had named the group after Troy Shondell, but right, that's, not yes. really the, that's not really the truth. The Shondells Good. was a name that I actually came up with in study hall, if you can believe that. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, that, that's a myth great. that we've uh, cracked here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's the story I heard about Troy Shondell. Perfect. Well, that's although I, I, you know, Troy, Troy is a good singer. I, I don't really know, <laughs> but uh, Troy sings life. I, 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 I really liked uh, This Time by Troy Shondell. That was very diplomatic of you, Tommy. Nice well, that's the truth. <laughs> okay, no, I'm sure. Uh, absolutely. Well, Tommy, I, I can't thank you enough. It was such an honor and a privilege to talk thank to you. Thank you, my and, friend. And it's thank you so much for the music and it's been the great to music. talk with you and thanks for all your all your flattery I appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's it all came from the heart. Thanks so much, Tommy. You take care now. You too. Bye now. Bye bye.